Can you hear me? There you can, okay. And we're back, everybody. Can I ask everybody to take their seats? Because I do not want to deny you your opportunity for lunch. The title for our upcoming session is a big one. It's on maritime tourism. Let's face it, 70% of the Earth is water. The cruise business has recovered miraculously and wonderfully since the pandemic in ways that nobody could have imagined. The shipyards are once again, once again busy. They're probably at 100% capacity building ships of every size and pedigree. But the question before the pandemic and the question after the pandemic remains about sustainability, responsibility, the environment, and the environment defined as more than just the actual ocean. And we'll get to that in a second. So to start things off, let me please welcome to the stage Roberto Martinoli, who is the senior advisor to the president and CEO of Royal Caribbean Cruises. Have a seat right over there. Is this on now? It is. So, yeah. Roberto, we have a situation where you know, we had the best of times, the worst of times. We're now entering the best of times. Uh, ships are full. Uh, they're generating tremendous amount of income. Shipyards are busy. But the issue that was with us before the pandemic is still with us after the pandemic, and that is the, role, you know, the road to decarbonization. You know, how, do you, how do you manage your carbon footprint? How do you manage your impact on the environment in so many different ways? And I go back to the days when you know, major cruise lines, including Royal Caribbean, which predated your arrival at Royal Caribbean, were being fined substantially for polluting harbors or oil discharge. Uh, well, we're beyond that now. It's more than, than that. It's about fuel. It's, it's about uh, recyclables. It's about consumption. It's about educating passengers as well as ports. So as the senior advisor to the CEO of Royal Caribbean, which I believe is the second largest cruise line in the world. It is. Uh, what steps are you taking in a meaningful way on a fleet-wide basis to deal with those issues? Because I think your passengers have changed. They're coming on more educated now. They're asking different questions that they never used to ask. In the old days, the questions were like, am I sitting in the first seating or the second seating? Now they want to know with, what are you doing with single-use plastics and then beyond that. But most importantly, about fuel, about your fuel source. Yes. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to say, first of all, that uh, this is not a Royal Caribbean affairs. This is an affairs of the, of the cruise industry in general. Uh, we are all building the same ships. We are all using the same equipment. We are all using the same suppliers. So, uh, and tremendous effort is being put in place by the cruise line to uh, you know, improve uh, the performance uh, of our ships. And uh, not only do we work uh, very diligently on what the new buildings uh, are, because on new ships, of course, the introduction of new technology is easier, but a lot, a real lot has been done on the existing fleet where many of the uh, systems on board have been upgraded and uh, and many of uh, the uh, procedures that uh, are in place uh, have been kind of adapted to the need of uh, uh, decarbonizing our business. Uh, needless to say that uh, we are also being pushed by the fact that oil is very expensive. So if we, if we burn less oil, uh, we, we decarbonize in a way and, uh, and we, are, we are also achieving uh, a financial result that is helping us to be able to invest in the many other initiatives that are in place. Um, I was, uh, I think that it would be great uh, uh, if uh, we were a little bit more uh, outcoming in communicating what we are doing. Uh, probably as an industry, we've been a little bit shy in the, in the past years. Uh, I think that actually COVID teached us a big lesson uh, because if you remember at the beginning of COVID, uh, you know, the, 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 the cruise ships were seen as the worst place on earth. Well, you were seen and, as an incubator. Eh? You were seen as an incubator. Well, we're seen as an incubator, but I mean, uh, the, then things have been completely transformed. And actually, we were uh, uh, going back into service, and we've been able to convince uh, all of our partners uh, 
uh, you know, like the all of the health authorities and everything that uh, on ship things are taken really very, very seriously. And there are uh, ways to uh, control the environment in a ma much better way. Uh, there are incredible installations. I have to say that if you were talking about water and garbage, I mean, our ships are almost completely independent with the, with the production of water. If you were to go and see what is the uh, way that we tr treat waste on board of a ship, you'll be absolutely uh, incredibly surprised. It's, uh, it's like entering into an hospital to get into a garbage room. We do a lot of recycling and we do all of the things that uh, very, very hardly are found shoreside uh, because we are an independent little village and we are extremely regulated. We are controlled every step of the way. So even if we didn't want to, we need to do it in the right way. And I don't think there is any better way to do it than what cruise ships are doing today. Well, you know, when you talk about the evolution of that, I remember, you know, new technology trying to manage old technology, new systems, new fuel sources. Uh, I remember at one point you had a situation where you're still using traditional fuel, but then you put in scrubbers. Yeah. Um, and that, what that really meant for most of us who were cynical journalists is that, oh, we didn't see the smoke, right? What? But, but now you've gone beyond that. But remember, everybody's talking about new fuel systems, whether it's hydrogen or LNG or low sulfur. I mean, is there one solution? Well, I don't think that there is one solution. And uh, maybe, I mean, it's important to remember people that uh, ships are going all over the world. And uh, f the fuel that is available today in every place in the world is, uh, is diesel oil, and there is, I mean, you know, the, the supply chain is organized like that. There are areas of the world where other fuels are available, but they are not everywhere. So, and this is a big complication because ships, they need to be able to navigate the 70% of the Earth's surface that is covered by water, and they need to be able to be supplied with the fuel. So what the industry has been doing in the meantime, and all of us did it one way or another, we are all looking into alternative fuels. Alternative fuels, there is hydrogen, there is ammonia, there is methanol, uh, you name it. There, there are so, uh, biofuels, uh, uh, LNG, so there are a lot of different options that are available today. The, the problem is that uh, the one solution that would cover the entire world is not available yet, but there is a which, lot which of... Which is activity. what? Excuse me? Which is what? What is that one solution? Well, I don't think anybody knows what it is. I mean, we all need to do our homework and, and diligently invest and spend... Uh, uh, actually, I would say that uh, it would be nice to see a little more support in this R&D effort that the cruise lines are doing because uh, we are a little bit left alone in, in terms of uh, what technology do we need to uh, employ for the future. And uh, there have been good examples and uh, in, in, in the U.S. as an example when, when we started looking into um, upgrading our wastewater treatment systems uh, the, the, the environmental agency allowed us, the cruise industry, to introduce uh, experimental systems and uh, be given a grandfathering for a, certain, for a certain amount of time to allow us to experiment and find what was it that was going to be solving the problem, which we did in the end, and that was extremely helpful. Today, I see that, in general, regulators are a little bit uh, shy and they are not very willing to participate into this effort, which is inevitable if you want to get uh, faster to a solution. By the way, in the meantime, we all have increased uh, uh, our efficiency by 20, 30 percent at least. I mean, all of us, they, with no exceptions. All of the operators in the cruise industry have done that. So even without finding the final solution, we are looking in, into whatever uh, 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 you know, option is, is available, and we are all spending time and money and uh, all working towards this uh, decarbonized uh, cruise vessel that is supposed to come within 2050. Well, before we get to net zero in that department, I want to go back 20 or 30 years to a case study or a story that I covered, which was a, a basic common sense solution. It happened up in Alaska, where the, where the state of Alaska made a ruling that no cruise ship could enter a port unless it plugged in. Um, yeah. and, and that really was something we could actually see, we could touch, 
we could measure that when a ship is at the port and, and not going anywhere, why would you keep all your engines going? Basically, imagine the world's largest extension cord plugged into the ship, which really had an impact on, the, on everybody, including the power grid. Well, I mean, the, this is another interesting uh, uh, situation because, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 we have the, this, uh, uh, I think 50% of the existing ships have the ability to plug in. I don't think that we get uh, near to any small percentage of the ports around the world that are able to give electricity. The other thing is that where is this electricity coming from? Because uh, we... Also fuels. I, I mean... We are using the very same engines that are used in uh, power stations. So it's the very same technology. I, I know that because many of our engineers, when they get uh, to the end of their career, they go and work short side for power stations. So I mean, you know, that's the, it's, a, it, it's a single word. So if you have hydropower, and you are, I mean, if you are very fortunate, like uh, uh, certain countries that have a lot of hydropower or, or geothermal power, I mean, of course, you, uh, you can put in place a certain policy, if not. But we are ready. We are ready to go. All of our ships are ready in, in a month to be, for those that are not yet uh, uh, ready with the plug, they are all uh, uh, ready to, to receive it in a very short amount of time. The problem is that uh, we don't have uh, where to plug in. Well, you can't look at this in a one-dimensional way. So which of the ports would you say are ahead of the curve that are actually ready for you? There are ports that are ready, and we do use it. I mean, of course, and of course, I mean, and uh, uh, there are a certain amount of peers, and normally uh, you do it in a way that the bigger vessel goes to the pier that is equipped with the with the plug-in facility. But still, there are not enough ports doing it. No, I think th things are changing. There is uh, a lot of uh, activity in that sector as well. So many, many ports are getting organized and. Uh, so I think that in a couple of years, we will see a very different situation there. Earlier today, we talked about public partners, public-private partnerships. I mean, I'm assuming that COVID allowed you to have those public-private partnerships to be able to solve those immediate problems. Have you been able to extend those to include the environmental issues that we're dealing with now? Um, well, I mean, with COVID uh, was uh, definitely a, a big lesson learned. And the fact that we were able to uh, communicate directly with the regulators has been uh, extremely helpful. Uh, of course, uh, it was uh, government by government, so it was a little different situation. Here, we are talking about a little more of a, a general, uh, how would say, um, organization that uh, is a little more difficult to deal with because uh, uh, it's difficult to point the right person. So. We have like uh, lobbying activity with the European community. We have lobbying activity with EPA in the US. I mean, we have lobbying activity in Asia, but uh, uh, it's a little more difficult. It's a little well, more political, I would say, if you allow me the term. I mean, although with COVID, you didn't have a choice. All cruising stopped. It all came to a halt. And you could not create an itinerary or move a ship unless you complied with something like 74 different uh, requirements yeah. that were issued as a public health service. Well, yes. the environment's a public health service, too. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and uh, as you remember, because we were together, I mean, I think that uh, a big help was given to us by Greece, who opened uh, cruising, uh, you know, first uh, before anybody else, and, uh, and the facts prove that uh, the industry was uh, very well managed, and uh, immediately after, everybody followed suit, and uh, we were able to operate uh, almost everywhere. When we come back, I want to talk about that. But in the interest of time, I want to welcome some of the other members of our panel. If they could come up, please. We have Dr. Will Bateman from C-Cell, C-Cell Renewables. Lyndon Koppel, the Vice President of Sustainability and ESG for MSC Cruises. We have Spiros Ampertis, who's the Vice President of Port Operations, Itinerary Planning and Management from Crystal Cruises. And of course, Isabel Gibson from ICF, who's the Senior Consultant for sustainable aviation fuel, which plays into exactly what Roberto and I were, were talking about. Uh, so, panelists, welcome. Uh, Lyndon, let me start with you, because you came from aviation. You're now in the cruise industry. Are there synergies of lessons learned? Absolutely, uh, Peter, yes. Um, you know, I think one of the differences with the maritime industry is there is arguably more uh, opportunity for diversity when it comes to the energy transition. 
you know, one of the things about maritime that I'm sure we'll talk about is the fact that it really is all about a liquid hydrocarbon fuel from a different feedstock. And that's really what we're talking about here. You know, the, the vehicle that's using it doesn't care what the feedstock is. It just wants to have that same molecule, and that's the same. Within the maritime industry, of course, we can look at potentially different solutions. At the moment, for example, LNG, which we see as, uh, we used to use the term transitional, but it's really a fuel in transition. But Carnival Cruise Lines has already ordered an LNG ships, and I think they're online. Well, we, we, we also, we have two operating right yeah. now, and we've ordered more. But, you know, the thing about LNG is that it can transition very easily to a non-fossil-based one. And again, it all comes down to the fact that if that molecule is the same molecule, the ship does not care that it came from a bio source, that it came from a synthetic source, um, and we can potentially use that. And then we also have options like fuel cell technology. You know, in our case, we're, 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 we're testing a fuel cell on one of our ships, and that's a completely different way of creating heat and energy. If we can use that for the hotel load of a ship, it means that even if we go to a place that doesn't have shore power, which is growing, I mean, when we know, particularly in Europe, through, through the legislative requirements, that we're going to see a lot more places, but we go to a lot of smaller island nations that will never have shore power available, and we can't expect them to make that huge investment, especially when it's not an all-year-round acti all round activity. They're the places that something like a fuel cell will mean that you can use hydrogen or a derivative of hydrogen and then be zero emissions while you're in port when you only really need that power for your, for your hotel load. I want to put some perspective in this, speaking about MSC, in the, in the overall history of cruise lines, you're a relatively new line, but in the overall history of shipping, you're the biggest player on the block. How many ships in the MSC fleet? I know there's over 800 in, in the cargo fleet. I think by capacity, it's the biggest cargo con uh, containerized cargo now, which is pretty incredible because still fairly new. 1970, when Captain Aponte bought his first ship, he's still working in the office. I see him in the canteen. I mean, it's an incredible <laughs> kind of backstory, completely ho wholly owned business, incredibly humble family. Um, you know, um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great story. But by comparison, the cruise industry is a very visible industry. The shipping industry, not, not so much. So what technology can you apply across the board? Yeah, I mean, and this is, this is the thing is that, you know, we get a disproportionate amount of attention as, as, as the crude industry. You know, the crude industry in general, the large cruise vessels, what, less than 500 in the world, but, you know, containerized shipping, you know, you're talking many thousands. One of the things, I mean, we, it's horses for courses in this industry. Let's not assume that every single vessel that goes on the sea is going to have the same solution. A ferry boat that goes between two ports can be electrified much more easily than maybe other, other types of vessels. We can't look at electrifying the business that we operate. We certainly can't look at electrifying the cargo industry where you're going very long routes. One thing they're doing is creating these green corridors, which is a fantastic idea because there's so many core containerized shipping routes in the world moving from Asia into Europe, Asia into America, that are so frequently used that even if you identified 20 of those and made those particular corridors green by making sure the infrastructure is available at each end to get the fuel that you need to be able to do those journeys, you can make a significant difference. And that's why, even though we work as one and we have very similar strategy between the cargo and the, and the cruise business, there are still very different solutions out there. Well, then, of course, there's a, there's a matter, we talked about this a little bit earlier, of availability of the fuel itself. And I go to you, Isabel, on this, because how many times have we seen in the news over the last six years, let's say, um, an airline like Virgin testing by, you know, SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, um, and it works. There's no doubt about the fact that it works. You can measure the actual efficiencies, not just in terms of, of cost, that's another issue, but in terms of the environment itself. But the availability of SAF isn't great enough for anybody to adopt to it yet because the price is too high. Yeah, and I think price is a huge challenge um, across sustainable fuels. We see it, you know, for all industries. Um, I think. Can you hold the mic just a little closer because we have all this background noise yeah, here? Yeah, no problem. Is that better? Much better. Great. Um, yeah, I think SAF is SAF 
cost is a huge challenge um, for aviation. Sustainable fuel costs is a huge challenge for, for many industries. Um, I think the challenge with aviation is that, you know, like maritime, we are a hard to abate sector, which means that we have limited strategies available to us just because of the nature of operations. Um, sustainable aviation fuels is kind of the main solution at the moment. It's proven, um, it's available. Um, IATA estimate that you know 65% of decarbonisation across the industry by 2050 will come from SAF. So it's undeniably a huge player. Um, but you know we need to work on uptake. So SAF is is available. It's being produced um, largely in the US because of kind of policy incentives that are available. Um, but you just mentioned a very important policy incentives. Yeah. What's the incentivization opportunity in the cruise industry that's available now? Is there? Uh, maybe occasionally in some location. Spiros? N no, no. I think um, few, few areas not really covering all the world. So, I'm sorry, Lennon. Well, I think the regulatory environment is such a huge driver for us in terms of the, you know, the penalties. You know, I mean, one of the frustrations uh, of this, uh, the, the 5055 in Europe is that it's mainly around penalizing the industry. And it's quite, it's quite interesting because one of the differences with, a, with aviation is that the fuel EU maritime requires us to have a certain carbon intensity per unit of, of fuel, whereas the same regulation for uh, aviation is put on the fuel provider. The fuel provider has to provide that fuel, whereas we're penalized for not using it in our industry. So, so how do you fix that? Well, well, we, it means that we have to go out and source it, but the onus is not on the provider. So, you know, the, they're not necessarily incentivized in the same way that we are. Well, that has to get into governmental, governmental policy. Yeah. So in all of your efforts, who, which government seems most likely to figure out, this, figure out the numbers? Well, Europe is certainly ahead of the game, right? No, there is not really <laughs> the, the great government. We all get some uh, privilege based on the status of the, of the cruise line also, based on the itineraries which we are building, based on the type of grade which we burn. But in general, as a cruise industry, there is not a perfect government. And we definitely we need more help from every government to achieve what they are looking from the cruise industry. It really needs to be the IMO. I mean, that's what we want. And exactly the same as ICAO within aviation. We need to have this globally applied, fair, equitable, and we, we, we want to avoid that patchwork of measures in different areas of the world that will affect us in a different way. I think it's important as well to kind of consider that, yes, policy is extremely important, um, but it's almost a case of perfect's the enemy of the good in, in, in this situation. You know, we're all waiting for that solution, for that support. Um, and, you know, it, we hope that it will come along. It's definitely a really um, kind of key aspect of, of this story. Um, but what can we do in the meantime as well? So it's not just a case of waiting for that to happen. It's you know, working as the supply chains, all of the actors within, within um, maritime, within aviation together um, to develop solutions that we can deploy today um, and until a better solution comes along. I remember a time not that long ago, it, it predated the pandemic, when one airline, Delta Airlines, said, you know what, we're going to just buy a refinery. They bought their own refinery. Now, they didn't do that because of the environment. They did it because of cost and hedging their fuel purchases. But at least they started doing that. Since that time, every time I ask Delta Airlines, how is the refinery coming, I'm greeted by silence. Okay? So the question is, Bill, you, Bill, you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I just want to add to this. I mean, you're talking about going to certain, certain islands and then not actually having the fuel. But why aren't you investing in those islands? So, for example, you could be building um, offshore wind uh, power stations that they could never themselves ever afford to build, um, which could be storing up some sort of like an ethanol or even perhaps a hydrogen-based fuel. So then the cruise line, as it comes in, can not only offloading the, the passengers, but can be picking up that fuel at the same time. So it becomes a very nice integrated um, solution to that. Is anybody doing that? Not that I know of. Spiros? I think there are some ideas to build, but definitely we need the assistance from the governments, from the local entities. So. Going back to what Nico said on the previous panel, public and private sector needs to work together, like we did for, the, for COVID. Now to choose a type of grade is like you choose vaccine. 
in, in the period of COVID. It's not easy and definitely we all want to go to the same direction, but at the moment it's a gray zone. All right, so here's the next question. Let's go back to COVID. All that stuff that happened then was based on a crisis. It was based on a crisis that needed urgent attention, and it was based on protocols, rules, regulations, directly, directly purported to health and safety. Isn't this the same thing? Yeah, I believe it's, uh, it, it, it is the same thing, but we have a time to achieve the goal. Uh, because if we're talking about zero, net zero, if we, let's say, let's say crisis today, half of the shipping needs to stop in Europe, as example, because we are not able to, to go today to zero net emission. This is why all cruise lines working in some time frame to achieve that. But the government needs to help us also. I mean, we, we are alone. Seems that the, the last five years, for anything bad goes to environment, is only cruise lines. But it's not like that. Are you saying you're targeted? Uh, no, no. I think that uh, there is a big difference between what was an health issue where you had to deal directly with the health uh, organization of each and every country. So you had a name and an address of a person who was responsible for that. When you get to talk about uh, environmental regulation uh, at the European level or the IMO level, Unfortunately, it's more of a political thing because those decisions are made in those big commissions where there are no technicians at the table, but there are, there are mostly politicians. So you don't have like a counterparty to discuss and explain what the problem is, which is exactly what happened with COVID. So even though with COVID, we had to deal with a number of different uh, 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 governmental organizations, we knew what the counterparty was and we, after trying several times, we've been able to, uh, uh, you know, start a dialogue. In this case, it's, it's really uh, extremely difficult. We have our organization that do that for, you know, they do our, the lobbying for ourselves. We have uh, the Cruise Line International Association, well represented in Europe and in the U.S. and everything, but uh, it's a tough job. It's a very tough job. You know, when you talk about negative incentives, uh, I, I, you know, negative incentives tend to happen when the private sector doesn't do it themselves. And next thing you know, the government kicks in and says you'll do this or you will pay a penalty. The example was in the aviation business. Uh, this goes back, I hate to say it because it makes me feel older, about 12 years ago, they had something called the tarmac delay rule. And the rule came about because airlines were pushing back from the gate, usually in bad weather situations, and were leaving passengers stranded on the plane, not going anywhere for more than three hours. So finally, the government stepped in and said, okay, here's the new rule. Anytime you push back from the gate and you keep your passengers, passengers prisoners for more than three hours, you will be subject to a fine of $27,500, not per incident, per passenger. So a 737 represented a seven-figure seven fine. How many tarmac delays have there been in 12 years? Five, right? So wait, what happened during the pandemic? Negative negative incentives. You were not allowed to sail. You could not sail unless you did X, Y, and Z because not every cruise line had gone fast enough or could have gone fast enough at that point to do that. So where is the solution now? We all know the problem. We all know the challenge, but I mean, short of buying another refinery, what is it? But what I might say is that while uh, on, on the two examples that you gave, there was a practical solution here we are giving a negative incentive for something which solution is not there yet. Because that's the reality of facts. So if you want to comply with what the rules that are coming from now for the next 20 years are, you cannot tell me what it is that will make it happen. It oh. does not exist yet. There are several attempts. We are all investing time and money to get there, but we are not there yet. So giving a negative incentive for something which solution is not available is a little bit different than giving a negative incentive for something which is theoretically doable. So they are, it's a little bit different. Yes, but one other thought to that, because you just said we're waiting for the rules to come down. Who's making the rules? Is it, are you initiating the rules or are you only reacting to them? The, the rules that are the organization that are appointed to make the rules, that are the, 
European Will I go to you? The IMO and <laughs> I'm, I, I, this is driving me crazy because, you know, I don't rob your house because there's a policeman standing on the corner. I don't rob your house because it's a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, and it's the, you know, this discussion so far has been very much focused on fuels. But what about the biodiversity? I mean, what about the, the sewage that I, I was cruise liners put, put into the ocean? I mean, I, I've got a couple of sort of simple antidotes here that I'd just like to share. You know, so we all love scuba, di scuba diving, okay? If I give this crowd here a camera and you go scuba diving, apparently 90% of the time you will end up damaging the reef, right? If I take the camera away from you, because you're not focused on trying to take a picture, you actually think about where your fins are, what they're doing, that in, in turn means that, that that drops about one in six times now you damage your reef. Now, if you go down and you're supervised with a qualified instructor, the, the damage to that reef now drops to less than 1%. Okay? And so these are simple things. We don't need the IMO or anybody else to be telling us what to do. We just we can work it out. It's logical. Um, and I can, you know, I've got hundreds of numbers I could quote here on different things. But we've got to start thinking in the same way that we think about risk to um, humans, you know, when we put people on ships, when we put them offshore structures, we do a risk assessment. We need to be doing sustainability assessments on every single thing that we do throughout life. And it's encouraging to see that the cruise liners have now got these sort of sustainability people on board. Um, but more needs to be done, and you shouldn't be waiting for the IMO. I mean, a lot of this is, is just a small cultural change. It doesn't require well, I'll give you. I'll give you technology. one example. I mean, I'm sorry, it was, it's a different context, because if we are talking about uh, a negative incentive, then this is what I'm telling you. On the other side, the cruise line have been investing tons of money and have been driving all the improvement in technology you see today. And by the way, the quality of our sewage is better than drinking water in many parts of the world. I mean, I, I'm happy to share with you the information about it. So the, the, the treated sewage water that gets off a ship is better than drinking water in many parts of the world. But the one thing, Will, that I, I, I will agree with Roberto on is you now have cruise lines, and you can speak to this, Lyndon, and you can speak to this, Spiros, where you have not only a zero tolerance policy about what goes over the side of the ship, which is nothing, but you also, and I encourage anybody here who's taken a cruise, it's not a tour that they give. I think that's a mistake. I think they should give the tour. You want to take the tour of the waste management deck not just the waste management facilities, you have cruise ships where an entire deck is devoted to waste management. And when you see how glass is treated, cardboard, plastic, um, gray water, black water, it's amazing. It, it, there are some cities in America that can't even come close to that because what the cruise ships can do is they can actually manage it. That's the good part. But I want to go back to something else you just said, Will, because it deals with the word environment in a different way. And that is the impact on the resources of a destination when a cruise ship shows up um, and, the, and there are environmental aspects of that as well. You're seeing certain countries now, Croatia's one, Bermuda's another, um, we're, we're seeing it happening in other cities like Amsterdam and Venice where they're trying to limit either the number of cruise ships allowed to dock in one particular place or the number of cruise ships that are allowed to dock in a country at any one time. We've seen that in Bermuda, we've seen it in Croatia and Initially, the cruise lines didn't like that idea at all. Obviously, it really impacted your scheduling. That's your area, Spiros. But in the end, it worked better for everybody because now when, when, when I go on a trip and, and I've booked a cruise, the first call I make might surprise you. I call the ports that I'm going to saying, on this day, how many ships will be in the port? And if there's more than two, I'm not going because I don't want to wait in line for a bathroom. I, it, it, it takes away, it's like going to Santorini in the summer for other reasons. To what extent are the cruise lines doing the initiation here of figuring out schedule in a way? Uh, for example, you have a ship right now, Lyndon, called the, uh, the Explorer One. And part of their mantra is that they're scheduling the ship to absolutely be there when no other ships are there. They're, they're showing up, what, is, what are most cruise ships doing? Eight o'clock in the morning arrival, five o'clock in the afternoon departure, your ship is showing up at five o'clock and overnighting, which is, a, which is a, a, for the locals, it's greater for their environment, it's greater for the passenger experience, and the cost is, not, is, is negligible. So to what extent are you guys working on scheduling so that you're not overtaxing the environment? Yeah, I mean, this is something now that we've got a much greater level of appreciation for as the cruise industry is growing. 
Um, so it's driven, of course, partly by us, by, by doing those kind of activities, making sure that we, we are scheduling, but also working more directly with the set destinations. I think there's an element of frustration when a port will want to maximize their revenue, but they're not necessarily having the discussions with the destinations about the ability to be able to cope with the numbers. Now, we see this changing very much in some of these key destinations, Dubrovnik, Venice, Barcelona, working through CLEAR now, um, the Balearic Islands, and having these charters, these charter Pull agreements. the microphone just a little closer. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, having these charter agreements to make sure that we are both looking at the schedule, keeping with the, within the requirements. And it's really for the ports to implement, you know, because, of course, as we go and we say, have you got a parking place on this day? Then, yes, I'll have a parking place. But now, if they're limited, then that you know, that means that we have to think more carefully about when we go, how we go, how we manage the numbers of our, of our, um, of our. So the slight limit to what we can do. So that has to be driven by those measures. But again, we can also work much more closely with the destinations. And that's what we're doing. And also diversifying. This is really important. Diversifying the offerings once our passengers get off. We would prefer not to just have three or four key destinations that everybody wants to visit our attractions. We work really hard with the, with, the, with, with the local tourist boards, with our tour operators, to get them to come up with ideas. And I think COVID has helped with this, an appreciation of moving away from the more crowded areas. Which brings up this historical fact. Going back to the original days of that television series, The Love Boat, right? How many ports did they call in mythically? Maybe three. How many ports do the cruise lines call on today? I think it's over 1,600. I mean, when you actually add up around the world, and they're not all just the usual suspects. There's an opportunity for them to actually improve the environment in the local destin destination that they're going, simply because they're there if they do it responsibly. And then it gets into all the other houses, and therefore, I want to get to something for you, Will, and that is, um, I think I could speak for all the, 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 the lines here uh, that Every cruise line likes to say, especially in the Caribbean, we have our own private island or islands, right? These are islands that already existed. Uh, they, they were part of another country. The cruise line then basically redesigns the island, puts in the infrastructure, puts people there to live full time because that island is being used every single day of the week by some lines with different ships every day, right? But Will, you're all about something else, about building artificial reefs. I mean, so, so our company build, you know, we build artificial reefs. So we can build huge structures that could, you know, you could dock one of your ships against all the way down to something the size of a chair to do sort of habitat restoration. And, I mean, in a, in a strange way, you know, to build a reef is nothing clever. You know, the Romans did it years ago. You go out and buy the, find the largest rock you can pick up. <laughs> you can throw it in the ocean. And you just keep piling those up until something happens. But if you think about that approach, you've gone to a quarry, you've dug, dug out your large rock, you've hauled it across the countryside, and you throw it in the ocean. And every single part of that journey has had quite dramatic ecological impacts, um, from, you know, from, even from the silt that's being churned up and created within, within the, the reef you're creating. So what we're, our, you know, we've spent the last four or five years not trying to reinvent a new rock. It's about how do you fundamentally change the structure so that you can avoid many of these, these um, implications and ultimately come to a solution that is uh, a net positive gain. So everything we do, we want to ensure that we you know, enhance the fish, we enhance the corals, we enhance the seagrass. You know, it, it leads to a positive effect. Um, and I, th I mean, this, just coming back a little bit to the, the, cruise, the cruise business, I mean, um, I think, I mean, Roberto and I were discussing this earlier. I think they've got a, a phenomenal business model that allows them to do something that really no one else can do because you've got everybody locked onto a ship. You know, it's, it's sort of, you've got this captive audience. You can make that one or two weeks that they spend on your ship the most sustainable um, ecological experience that they will ever, ever have in their entire lifetime, right? And it's through an, an, quite a small number of incremental changes. And we've, you know, we're talking about CO2 in carbon, but actually there's a lot more. And you just talked about recycling. There's a lot of other stuff about you know, where's the food coming from? Could you, you know, provide them with a food where it's, um, you know, it's, you know I, I'm a big fan of Impossible Burgers. If you put a beef burger and an Impossible Burger in front of me, I would go for the Impossible Burger every time. And I'm, exactly. I'm a, You actually like the Impossible Burger? Yeah. 
it is better. It's, it's tastier. It's nicer. And I'm I'm a farmer. I used to. My father used to grow cows, and we used to have slabs of meat and two veg every day. Okay. I am, you know, you can change habitat habits. You can change people's use of sunscreens. You can put onto the ship um, things that are, you know, much much better for the environment. Even ensuring that, you know, you, when you the, the products that are on the ship, you know, the the, the the not just the food but the memorabilia people buy is all coming from local sources. Um, I mean, I was, I was at a conference the other day and they were talking about fashion. I mean, some, currently fashion contributes to like 5% of global CO2. They're reckoning it could rise to 25%. And that's because we produce, I don't know how many, tens of billions of garments that we don't need, you know? And they're, they're just talking about, okay, getting local involved in creating sort of jewelry, smaller items that are higher value and sort of building up the business. Um, so there's a, there's a huge amount that can be done. And I think the cruise line has got, a, a, you know, a perfect model to the, delivering that. And, and you will be surprised to see that many of the, the things that you are mentioning are happening already. And that's why I was saying before we should be more forthcoming in communicating better these type of messages because there is a lot of sustainable food, sustainable sourcing. We, th there are companies that have uh, food programs that are dedicated to the destination, obviously involving local sourcing and local people. There is a lot of that in every respect that is being done. I think that we all have to do a better job at uh, communicating better what we are already doing because you will be surprised. Yeah. There's, there's just, just to finish, I'll just say, you know, I mean, we've mentioned it already, that, but you've got to, we hear a lot about CO2, get it, super important, but um, biodiversity loss is probably as important, if not more so. And we've, we've got to be thinking every single time we do anything, what is the impact on the biodiversity within a region? We, I mean, the UK, for example, we've lost 50%. I mean, I'm coming from a, the worst country on the planet. But, um, um, another story, for example, in the Caribbean, I mean, how many people have seen turtles? You know, they're quite rare. In the 1700s, sailors used to hear the turtles, and there used to be herds of them, and they would, they would hear the shells clattering to gates each other. You know, we have dramatically destroyed our planet. And we have this habit of finding something that's a remarkable. The tourists rush in, and it's initially a, um, it's just it's a, it's a very you know unique, expensive thing. Then it becomes um, you know more and more cruise liners then go to that same destination, and what was once pristine and wonderful becomes destroyed. And there's a there's a saying for you know within my team at least, but they, they say they were telling me the other day that you should be going to the second best, not to the best. So you should go to the second best reefs. Because the best reefs, if you leave them alone, they will help to repopulate and restore and repair the, work, the, the ones that have been damaged. So when you're looking out for destinations, find the best, cross them off the map, please, and send everyone else to the second. Because otherwise, your best will just become the second best again, like everything else, you know? Well, let's talk about the numbers then. Because there are cruise lines that have uh, 200 passenger ships, and you have cruise lines, by, by the way, that's uh, across all the lines, right? They have a d diversity, right? And you also have cruise, cruise lines that have ships that if you add the passengers with the crew, you're over 8,000. How do destinations handle that? They're not, it, the, the facilities aren't there, and in terms of port planning, Spiros, you, you have to take those numbers into account. Yeah, of course. I mean, representing a uh, luxury brand like Crystal, one of the historical brands, our first priority is to go where those ships doesn't go at the same time. Because for us, our guests will not like really to have a next to our vessel a, a, a small town with 8,000 guests for many reasons. Also, there is an issue lately with overcrowd in many destinations, which of course you cannot sail cruise without those destinations, but at least we can work to open a new destinations. As example, Crystal, Instead of Athens, we're trying to open Thessaloniki, which is a giant of history, but nobody knows. Then Barcelona, another uh, strategic port, but there is also Tarragona, which you, you can really direct the vessel, one, two calls there, and see how that will work. Definitely, that is a, a, a huge planning, I think, from all cruise lines. And for us, as Crystal, we are looking, uh, let's say, unique destinations, avoiding a lot of ships for the best of our guests, of course. And uh, we try also to stay longer at the port, I mean, 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the evening, many overnights, because uh, we would will, we will like also 
for local community to come and see the ship and, and whatever Roberto mentioned earlier, to find out what good we are doing, not only bad things, <laughs> which they advertise lately, but many good things going on on board. And uh, certainly we love to help the local community. We have uh, uh, programs for universities, for students to come on board and see. So we, we are really planning a lot of good things for our guests. Well, the more you communicate in terms of fuel, which is what Isabel was talking about, what you were talking about, hopefully the, the, the policy makers will understand the incentives that are needed to get those refineries to produce in volume what you can actually consume. Yeah, we, we, we hope so. I just wanted to go back one minute to the size of the ships because uh, I, I'm part of a group that has small ships and I've been the yeah. CEO of a luxury cruise line for many years and uh, we also have big ships. So there are destinations that can adapt to big ships and there are destinations that cannot adapt to big ships. And the big ships tend not to go to the destination that cannot receive thousands of people. So. I think that uh, we need to take a little bit away the idea that these big ships are coming and overcrowding, also because when you go and look into the numbers, I mean, and you see where those uh, destinations that are considered to be overcrowded, the percentage of people that are coming from cruise ships is minimal compared to the rest of the people that are coming by plane, by car, by ferry, by anything else, by train. So, uh, and the other incredible advantage of uh, cruising is that we can predict today, the 15th of March 2027, how many ships will be in Barcelona, how many people will be on board, and what these will people will be doing. So it's a very predictable business. So if there is the, 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 the willingness to make it work, you can do a lot of great things uh, uh, combining with the local authorities, with the local operators to make sure that you know exactly what is going to happen with these people when and where. So again, uh, of course, uh, a very small port, I mean, cannot receive a big ship and it would be more suitable for a crystal or a silver sea vessel, but the large city where there are thousands and thousands of visitors, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of visitors, they can well receive big ships in a proper way if things are organized properly. And I think that as an industry, we gave a good example because when this uh, discussion of over tourism came out, we sat down among us and we took care of making sure that we were not coming with too many ships at the same time, although I do not believe that that was the problem of the overcrowding. Although one more thing, and let's be honest about it, the business model of some of the cruise lines with the big ships is what? The ship itself is the destination. Bravo. It's like you know the, the couple that comes back on a vacation Where'd you go on your vacation, Aruba? Where's that? I don't know. We run a ship. You know, I mean, that, that's, 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 that's very also true. Happening. But the overriding lesson, and I think we can all share this together, which goes back to 9 11, is that you're the one industry above anybody else that can reposition your assets. Hotels can't move, right? You guys can move, and that's, that's what saved you after 9 11 because you were able to literally reposition your ships back to U.S. ports and some cities in the U.S. that didn't even know they had ports, right? And those ships are still sailing from those ports today. And also during COVID, we were, you know, uh, uh, ports were shutting down overnight for the next day and we were able to direct them elsewhere. So we've been able to have continuous operation with geopolitical issues, with health issues and everything. And we always make sure that... Uh, our crew and passengers are absolutely safe. And so safe. the goal here is to be able to reposition your ships to locations that have refineries for alternative fuels, and at the same time keep people away with their fins and their, and their cameras from the reefs. Did I, did I basically sum that up? I think we need to think about it from a different narrative. So I think we focus a lot on the negatives um, with, with maritime and with aviation. Um, and I think we need to think about the opportunities. Um, so there is no denying that both industries have an impact on, on sustainability, you know, not just the environment, but we're talking about kind of social impacts as well. Um, so how do we address that going forward? Um, so obviously I'm going to use aviation as an example. At the moment, sustainable fuels, we, we, we can blend to 50%. Um, but we're currently working on a net zero flight with Virgin Atlantic, uh, which will be 100% 100% sustainable fuels. Um, yes, you know that's not kind of large scale at the moment in terms of being kind of commercially deployable. Um, 
but until we try, we don't know. Um, so I think it's about redirecting resources and focusing on the opportunities through innovation, through research, um, and doing you know what we can today um, to kind of build the solution for the future. Isabel, you give me the best segue line ever, because speaking of fuel, it's time for lunch. Isabel, Spiros, Lyndon, Will, and Roberto, thank you so much.